Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. These are words, Lord, that many of us grew up in, if we grew up in a Christian tradition. Words that so easily are taken for granted to speak to you as our Father. And Father, it is our prayer that the wonder of that reality, that privilege of accessing you as our Father, will reach greater depths, inspire a deeper willingness to want to please you and a deep rest in the fact that you are for us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God sent his Son and his Spirit so that we will change, we can change. Heck, we have changed. Here's an email I got this week. Let me read it to you. Now, wives, don't use this as a stick against your husbands. I don't think I told you how much things have changed since I came to you on the brink of divorce. It's been a miracle. Over the past two years, my husband has become such a great man, a loving husband, patient, gentle, slow to anger. There's a fruit of the Spirit. It's hard to remember how awful things were. I felt like I was dead inside, like I was his enemy. My daughter said to us tonight, you guys really love each other, don't you? I'm so happy that my kids can see that their parents uh, love and respect each other. It took me a long time to start to pray for our marriage. I don't know why, but I am so blown away how much God has changed my husband. I feel loved and safe, and he encourages me to be better. I'm so hopeful for the future and so grateful to God for the changes he has made in our marriage. Oh, and we love the outdoor area as well. Thanks. <laughs> Names withheld due to shyness. So what changed that man? I think he knew, and in fact I verified it because he comes to the 9 o'clock service, he knows who he is in Christ Jesus. And I wonder if you know who you are in Christ Jesus. So far in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul has kind of started to unfold these magnificent blessings that... Uh, we are forgiven sinners, able to walk out of God's courtroom knowing that we are right with God. No condemnation. None. And then we were reminded of how we've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, making permanently, making our body his permanent residence. And that that same Spirit is actually empowering us to do what God always wanted for his people, to love God and to love our neighbours, as evidenced by that beautiful email. But more than that, we have been adopted into God's family as children of God, literally as sons of God. For in the Middle Eastern culture, the son's got the inheritance. Friends, it's one thing for the guilty to be acquitted. Great. It's quite another for them to be adopted into God's family. Greater still. That's why the Borg's going to Malta. Uh, that's why we support our missionaries, so that others may know that the judge of the earth can be their dad as well, as we will see, to move a culture from religion categories to relationship categories. Well, let's look at verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Now, when it's brought a context, particularly the verse before, it's clear that those who are led by the Spirit isn't speaking about personal guidance, you know, that God has led me, the God's Spirit is directing me to this job or that ministry or that work or that spouse. In the context, it is about putting to death the misdeeds of the body. You know a person is led by the Spirit of God. You know that they're a child of God because there is a conviction to enter into what we call last week the fight club, a commitment to put sin to death. And God expects his children, whom he has given his spirit to, to live a life of repentance, which is another way of saying a commitment to be more like Jesus. And the only warning is if you decide to give up on the battle with sin. But this battle needs to be understood as one that happens from inside the family. Un fail to understand that and your Christian life will nosedive. Our successes with our sins in the power of God and our failures with our sins are both just as much in the context of having God as our Father. That is critical. Look at verse 15 and the implications of that. The Spirit you received 
does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry what? Abba, Father. What do you think is the highest blessing for the Christian? I think Jim Packer was right when he said it's not justification, it's not forgiveness, magnificent as they are and non-negotiable as they are. We haven't hit the top of the pops yet. The highest blessing, I think he's right in saying, is our adoption with God as our Father. Now, I know adoption gets bad press. There's been some bad stories. We understand that. But really, you'll never appreciate adoption once unless you understand the alternative. I remember meeting an, an Australian Ethiopian teenager at a Christian camp, and uh, her family did a good job in making sure she was still connected with her African uh, tribe and, and country. And so they would take her back. And I said, how do you feel about being adopted? She said, well, when my parents took me back to the, to the village from which I came from, then I realized how absolutely thankful I am that I was adopted because the poverty was so bad, the suffering so great, that my adoption means I've been liberated from all that. Oh, adoption was good news for her. Why? Because she knew the alternative. Without being adopted, we are dead, unable and unwilling to please God in the flesh. Now, the Spirit of God and the believer really functions. He is, and remember, he's a he, more of that in the future, but he's a he, and he who dwells within us actually functions as our adoption papers. Who remembers that great Stevie Wonder song? Sign, seal, delivered, I'm yours. Okay, I might need Jenny to help me with my singing <laughs> along with Edwin. We both share this lack of skill. I didn't know Maltese were bad at uh, music, but I, I, I don't feel so bad now. I'm normal. But in a sense, as we're children of God, why? Because the Spirit has signed and sealed us as ones who belong to the Father through Jesus Christ, soon to be delivered on the last day. We battle with our sin, not with the fear of punishment. That's off the agenda. You know, we're one wrong and you're kicked out where you're given like a quota of I'm sorry's and once you've used them up, that's it. No more, no more forgiveness. We, serve, we fear the Lord, why? So we can serve the Lord without fear. Fear of what? Fear of condemnation. There is no condemnation. This is the framework in which we live our life, in the, the framework in which we enjoy the victories in Christ and even the failures that are ours. Don't ever get tired of saying I'm sorry to God because I tell you this, he never gets tired of listening to you saying, I'm sorry. Oh, we've not received a spirit that enslaves us to fear. No, we'll leave that for the rest of the world religions. <laughs> we've come into relationship. And the great privilege is not that God is Father, but Abba Father. Now, it wasn't new for God's people to refer to God as a Father of Israel kind of collectively. And it's not surprising that Jesus, who is the eternal Son of God, addressed his Father, God, Abba Father, in the most intimate of terms. What's surprising here, and in Galatians, it's repeated, is that we who were once what? Enemies, spiritually dead, unwilling, unable to please God, are actually called, invited, and urged to come to the judge of all the earth as our dad. The same name Jesus addressed his father with can fall off your lips. Abba, it's an Aramaic word. No, we're not talking about the Swedish pop band. Money, money, money. No, different, different. Just having to be a strange coincidence. It's the most intimate word that describes how a child addresses their father. You know, there are 99 names for God in the Quran, and not one of them is father. <laughs> That's our privilege. Listen to um, uh, the Muslim convert. I can't pronounce her name, so I won't, but it's on the screen. Uh, the book's title, I Dare to Call Him Father. And here is a woman who is wrestling with the privilege as an ex-former Muslim, and now I come to Christ, how hard it is for her to grasp the fact that she can call God Father. Let me read it to you. Oh, Father, my Father, Father God, hesitantly I spoke his name aloud. I tried different ways of speaking to him. And then, as if something broke through for me, I found myself trusting that he was indeed hearing me, just as my earthly father had always done. Father, 
Oh my Father God, I cried with growing confidence. My voice seemed unusually loud in the large bedroom as I knelt on the rug beside my bed. But suddenly that room wasn't empty anymore. He was there. Father, oh Father, a lifetime of being told that Allah is distant and removed and unknowing and impersonal. In an instance, the ministry of the Spirit through Jesus Christ allows this woman to know that she is a child of God and that God is her father, her dad. Oh, we've allowed this privilege to be lost. A lot of Christians lament the fact that in Parliament, you know, that uh, it's the last scary of, of our Christian tradition still evident there in some ways, you know, where they start the sessions with the Lord's Prayer. I'm, I'm not sure I want to fight for that. I don't want 100 people who don't know Jesus saying, Our Father who art in heaven, when they are not children of God. That is the unique privilege of Christians. That is our God-given right. And not just Father, Abba Father. I don't know what you called your dad, your father, when you were growing up. Uh, I don't mean like the negative things behind his back. I mean like the positive. <laughs> Got to qualify. <laughs> you know, whether it was, you know, for me it was da, dad, it could be pa, or baba, or ta, um, whatever else it was, whatever is your normal affectionate term in your mother tongue, that is how you are to approach God, the sovereign ruler of the universe, daddy. I remember, I remember Prince Charles uh, at the 60th Jubilee and uh, uh, his mother's, the Queen Elizabeth II's 60th Jubilee, and he said something like, Your Majesty, Mummy. And it was so beautiful. Majesty. But for him, he was also, she was also his <laughs> mummy. I remember a friend of mine uh, praying, Dear Dad. And I can tell you, I cringed. It felt somewhere between too intimate and a little bit corny, you know, like I, I just couldn't work out why I was feeling uncomfortable. But you know what? That was my problem, not his, because that, he was entitled to address God that way. This was his, this is your God-given right. One woman at church sent me an email this week, and, uh, and she wrote this. It was so insightful. She said, I used to almost always pray to the Lord. I knew in my head God was my father, but didn't really believe it. A sister in Christ from MBM always prayed father and even daddy sometimes. It really bugged me. Till I asked myself why, why it was so hard for me to refer to my God as my father. I realised I really didn't believe he loved me. Felt sorry for me, yes. Saved me, yes. But actually loved me, mm, no. Relating to God as my Father has made a difference in my walk with Him. He is Lord. He is Saviour. He is Counselor. And He is my Father. That is who you are. And that is who you could be if only you would take the hand of Jesus. For those who seek Him, find Him. And God wants you to know that you're his child. Verse 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. It's interesting you know, God not only wants to adopt you, he wants you to know that you're adopted. It's when we, and it's interesting, it's in the context of crying out, Abba, Father, that the Spirit of God confirms with our spirit, which is another way of saying me, you, that we are children of God. And it probably explains, does it not, that when we get out of the habit of praying and praying to God as Father, that our experience of our union with Christ and our assurance starts to weaken. It's not that you're any less united with Christ, but your experience of that can suffer when you don't pray. This probably explains it, because it's in the context of Abba Father that the Spirit of God is testifying to my spirit, your spirit, that you're a child of God and so am I. And so we may grum grumble, why, gee, why, do I, why can't I feel God's presence? Well, don't grumble. Draw near to the throne of grace and enjoy the privilege of accessing your Father, even when you've botched it up, especially when you've botched it up. You know, one counsellor I knew many years ago, she said that she would always get her Christian clients to basically come and share 
uh, pray to their Father in Heaven for at least 20 minutes every day until she meets with them about the problem she, they want to talk to her about. And she said it was amazing how so many times, it wasn't like the problems went away, but they were casting their cares before their Father in Heaven and finding great comfort in, in actually putting to words what was in their heart and approaching God, the sovereign rule of the universe, as their Father. It's as though we kind of sit on his lap and get direct access, all of his attention focused on our particular concern. And as children of God, friends, everything that belongs to Jesus now belongs to you if you're in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, that is, inheritors, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The way of the... The, you know, the pathway of the, the Messiah is the same pathway as the Messiah's people, suffering and glory. But we're going to see that next week. For now, let's focus on the first part of that sentence. Did you get it? That okay? That we're actually co-heirs with Christ. And remind, let's remind ourselves who Jesus is. Second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, who is the one through whom and for whom the universe was created. That one. And that's the one you're told are co-heirs with, co-inheritors with. You know, on the will, there's Jesus' name, and right next to him is your name. That's why when Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth, he's talking about the new earth. Forget about stressing about the house prices in Sydney that you can't afford. Forget the block of land. That's, you know, you're, I'm, I'm not saying there's not a bit of stress about that. I don't want to play that down, but I don't want to play it up either. Think big. In Revelation, I think it's the church of Laodicea, where Jesus says, invites you to come and sit on the throne with him. Co-ruling, co-inheritors. Wow. Children of God. Oh, this language is so extravagant. Look at uh, later on in, in, in Romans 8, Paul says this, verse 32. He, the father who did not spare his own son, he did what ultimately he would never ask Abraham to do. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Your co-inheritors with Christ. That's what I call the prosperity doctrine. The problem with the health and wealth gospel, as it's often said, it's not what it promises, it's when it's going to deliver. It's promising too much here and now, but have no doubt, it's coming. Glorified body, where there is no more sickness, there's no more struggle with sin, fit for a new creation. That's all coming, along with your declared forgiveness now. All of that inheritance. You know, uh, of course, it all comes because why? You're adopted in Christ Jesus uh, to the Father. Now, just before one Christmas, there was the governor, federal governor general. He had invited a number of street kids who were homeless into his residence. It's a massive residence, right? And uh, these homeless teenagers lived in kind of cardboard boxes on the street, find themselves living in the, you know, not li visiting this palatial residence. And, uh, and one kid was interviewed afterwards and he said, oh, with his eyes popping out of his head, like he was so excited. You should have seen the food. The chef put it on. And he said the pool was so big and the house was great. And then he said, the governor general even shared his swimming trunks with me so I could swim in the pool. Whoa. And it's like the interviewer got so caught up with it. He said, wow, could you want for anything else? And quick as a flash, the teenager said, yes, I wish he would adopt me. <laughs> Why? Because adoption makes it all yours for all time. I mean, it's one thing to taste of the, you know, the rich and famous for a brief moment. But the thing about adoption is, it's all yours. He wanted the Governor General to be his dad. I fully understand that. But friends, in Christ Jesus, the creator of the universe, the owner of the universe, this age and in the age to come, is your father. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, please don't miss out on this. Ask and you will receive. Man, what a journey we've been on so far in these 17 verses from Romans 8. It's gold, diamond after diamond we're unearthing here. Remember how it started that we who were once enemies of God, spiritually dead, unable, unwilling to please God and obey the law, are now declared forgiven under no condemnation through Christ. 
And then we're told that God's spirit has made our body his home and turned us into the temple of God. That same spirit that is working through us, as evidenced by that husband we read about, transforming us to bear fruit instead of bear guilt. And then we're told that that same spirit functions like our adoption papers, signing and sealing us, soon to be delivering us with resurrected bodies. And then we're told we get to call the judge of all the earth dad. And then on top of that, we're told we get to share in the inheritance with Christ so that everything belongs to Jesus belongs to us. My goodness. And then we're told that we get to live with him forever. Wow. You know, one time my wife, Sandy, used to teach in a school where our kids were in the classroom that Sandy taught in. And, um, you know, I, I thought about it one moment. I thought, wow, all those kids got to call Sandy Mrs. Galea, but only her children got to call her mum. And only the children got to go home with Sandy at the end of the day. There's a picture there, isn't there? Only those in Christ Jesus are children of God who have the Spirit of God in them. They alone have the privilege of calling God Father. And they alone get to go home with the Lord Jesus at the end of the age. That's the framework in which you engage with sin and the temptations of the flesh. Lose that framework. Forget that you engage in the battle with God as your Father and you will crumble under the weight of guilt. So let me ask you a, a series of questions now. Is the Christian life livable? Answer, yes. Will you live a life without sin before you receive your glorious body? No. <laughs> Every day you'll be confessing. Is the temptation beyond what you're able to bear? <laughs> Not according to the Lord. Will you be forgiven again and again and again, even if you fall many times? Absolutely. Are you strong enough on your own to change? No way. Is the spirit in you powerful enough to transform you? Definitely. But some more personal questions as you battle with those recurring struggles. Do you hate how recurring sin is destroying your life and grieving God's spirit? Is it bad enough yet to actually want to change? Have you hit rock bottom? Because you know and I know that whatever comfort our sins give us in the moment, whatever false intimacy we've enjoyed in the moment, whatever pleasure you got, whatever, no matter how alive you feel in the moment, once that moment is over, that burst of gossip, that response to porn, the lie to cover up the embarrassment, whatever it is, the moment you and I fall, what is the dominant experience? Words like dead, ashamed, empty, hypocritical, guilty, withdrawn, numb. And when you get to that point, and we all do, friends, it is so critical at that point, you run to the Father in heaven who sits on a throne of grace. Because if you don't, I guarantee you'll go back to the sin. Because it's the only way you can manage your guilt. One way or another, you're going to go one of two ways. And you've got to train yourself in the midst of your failure as soon as you can. Not after you've kind of earned the right to climb back, begging approval for your father. Bang, as quickly as you've fallen, get in the run in the direction of your father in heaven. Because he sits on a throne of grace where you will find grace and mercy in your time of need. Every time. Arms open wide. You're not going to get the back hand. <laughs> So let Jesus, through his spirit, take you to the Father who sits on the throne and in that act you will glorify God. And as you battle with your, as you battle to put sin to death by the Spirit of Christ, or rather as you battle and then begin to find success, always with some failure, but success, then there is that deep sense of joy that comes knowing that God's Spirit is transforming you. And with that joy comes the knowledge that you are glorifying God from here right through to eternity. Let's pray. Just let's pause for a moment and let the Spirit of God 
take us to those things that he has been convicted, convicting us through the course of this message. Dear Father, may we never take this privilege of calling you Father for granted. You are indeed our Lord, King, Saviour, Judge. But most of all, you are our Father God, our Heavenly Dad. We know this to be only possible because of our Lord Jesus, our older brother, who has carried our sins to the cross. We know this is only possible because your Holy Spirit dwells within us right now. Dad, it feels strange that we have such intimacy, such access to the judge of all the earth. Heavenly Dad, we thank you that you not only adopted us, you actually want us to know we're adopted. Father, Whether our earthly fathers helped or hindered us to appreciate that word, let us know that you love us in a deeper way. Make known to us that you are for us, no matter how many times we fail and will fail. For with you there is no fear. We are sons and daughters. With you there is no condemnation. And this is absolutely awesome. All praise to you, dear Father, God, Dad, in Jesus' name. Amen.